actually written in 1943 um, by Siegfried Gideon in collaboration with Fernand Leger and uh, José Luis Sert, uh, a fine and totally established body of men uh, as of 1943, however you look at them. Paper on monumentality, which was a null subject at the time in the eyes of most uh, modern architects, so it was a forward-looking paper in a funny kind of way, concluding with nine points on monumentality, which I will rehearse again now. Well, not all of them, only five, eight, and nine, in fact. Five, today modern architects know that buildings cannot be uh, conceived as isolated units. They have to be incorporated into vaster urban schemes. There are no frontiers between architecture and planning, just as there are no frontiers between the city and its region. Correlation between them is necessary. Monuments should constitute most powerful elements in these vast schemes. That sounds suspiciously like, for instance, a first draft for the Italian Quartieri Direzionale, thinking, which, a theme which had kept coming back all through this. Uh, skip on to eight. Sites for monuments should, must be planned. There will be this will be possible once replanning is undertaken on a large scale which will create vast open spaces in the now decaying areas of our cities. In these open spaces, monumental architecture will find its appropriate setting, which now does not exist. Ah, uh, he sent a point, said he cynically. Um, nine, modern materials and new techniques are at hand. Light metal structures, curved laminated wooden arches, panels of different textures, colours and sizes. Light elements like ceilings, which can be suspended from big trusses covering practically unlimited spaces. I mean, what are we talking about if not those things here? Mobile elements. There they are, two mobile elements, labelled as such. Uh, mobile elements can constantly vary the aspect of these buildings. These mobile elements changing positions and casting different shadows when acted upon by wind or machinery can be the source of new architectural effects. In a sense, the whole programme I don't know whether Tangi knew this, conceivably he did, but ideas have a way of making their way osmotically through the whole architectural profession, as you know. The whole program for, as it were, the end of megastructure, 1970 at um, Osaka, I think, is the end of megastructure as a, as a dream, as a vision, uh, had been prefigured in 1943. Prefigured in literary terms, admittedly, but I would submit it also been prefigured uh, in physical terms in 1951 in that uh, work by one of the outstanding bearded knights of the British establishment, uh, Sir Basil Spence, uh, the Sea and Ships Pavilion for the Festival of Britain. No longer, alas, with us but available at least in carefully restored model form in these two rather dim slides. Or if you'd rather have it in the contemporary real-life view, um, these two shots of the Sea and Ships Pavilion when it's in its prime. But I think the important thing, the more important matters, are on the two colour slides. That is to say that there is not quite as possibly as as Tange realised it, but I think quite possibly as Gideon originally visualised it, um, a system of trusses, a gantry system, not unlike, dare I say it, in some ways, the Cedric Price Fun Palace, in, at least in part of its conception, uh, within which curved and lightweight elements and all that groovy Gideon stuff could be hung. Uh, it has its relation, I suppose, uh, to uh, transportation as it contains model ships and pieces of ships uh, and stuff about ships and things like that. Being part of an exhibition, it also contained, of course, homo ludens uh, in one form or another, almost by definition. Um, I don't think it's a comparison for which many people will thank me. That is the historian's burden, of course, to keep pointing out the wrong things. Uh, Bannum, that man who is using facts to pervert the history of the modern movement. Um, but nevertheless, I think, it, I think it does belong in here. Uh, I think one of the things which has been borne in upon me in making this study uh, is not only, as I say, that in the last resort the answer is Cumbernauld, um, but also that, as I said right at the beginning, it seems to me that megastructure is a far more central and less fringe, far more consensual and less radical, far more 
established and less revolutionary concept of architecture than any of us could have believed at the time. It is maybe only the wisdom of hindsight. It may yet be provable wrong, goodness knows. I mean, this is simply as, it, as the score, the state of play, as it appears to me, uh, at, uh, as of November 1974. And by spring 1975, I might well feel diff different about it. Let's say, at this point, it seems to me that one thing, which is, to use an appropriate word, established, is that although the megastructure trip was in many ways a uh, revolutionary and exciting and anti-establishment thing, the megastructure itself, the megastructure as constructed, was anything but. Right, thank you very much. Can we have the lights on, uh, etc. Ben, you're nearest the switches over there somewhere in the corner. Um, and, and the slides off. Uh, right. Arguments, objections, discussions, etc. Profound silence. I'll have a good. Th I'll have a good thing. Hello. I'm interested. Mm -hmm. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> the trip, as opposed to as constructed, as constructed to larger in time, certainly this was slide to me first. There was this format element in the as constructed part of the area. Where do you think what what you see the as constructed, isn't the spin-off of the trip. In fact, as, as, as the dates you know, have come out on the slides, uh, the, the spin-off wasn't so much a... Um, I mean, as constructed wasn't a spin-off because it was being constructed... While the idea was, while still, the idea was yeah. still there. Right. Mm. Um, what do you see, or have we got to wait for the, the book? <laughs> what do you see as the spin-off of the trip? Um, spin off of a trip, I think, has been very largely educational. I think you'll probably agree with that. I mean, uh, this whole business about megastructure being so very largely an academic affair suggests to me that the megastructure concept had a, a value, operational, pedagogic, or something, uh, for the educational scene, which was extremely important. The point we also made, I don't know you were here that time, about the comparison between megastructure and Bucky as liberated, you know, that the Instead of designing your, you know, your as prescribed in AA program cultural centre on, you know, one block of Tottenham Court Road, and decide that the whole of Tottenham Court Road will be a cultural centre and cover it in a single giant trust structure with mobile elements underneath it, and everything. those were extremely liberating things. The idea of a building not as a finite form, but as something which might ramble on mm -hmm. uh, and, in a sense, never be finished. These, I think, I mean, those aspects. Trip, I think, were extremely liberating. I'm sure that's where the real residues are. But the people who pursued those the those ideas got off the megastructure trip. There's a point that Peter Cook, who is not with us tonight, so I'll say it for him, Peter Cook has made more than once that the structure parts of the megastructure, you know, the, the real doable parts, uh, were not what most of the English people were interested in. I think that's true. But what they were interested in were, in fact, the potentials of liberation contained in the smaller mobile elements that he was already talking about there. Um, I think that's the trip. Uh, the actual content of the trip, I think, because it's really obviously far more than the I mean, the content of the trip is from a great deal of graphics. I mean, architectural graphics, I think the public are never going to look the same again. That may be a coincidence. I mean, maybe that kind of graphics are going to happen anyhow. You know, but I mean, some minor accident of fate might have, say, Peter Cook rather than Tony Gwilliam working for Nova. Mm -hmm. And then goodness knows what would have happened with fashion graphics. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, uh, certainly, I mean, but that's not just an archigram thing here. I mean, there is a sudden upsurge of highly professional interest in graphics in architecture, so it would seem to be worldwide. You know, graphics suddenly goes crazy. Uh, and a great deal of the megastructure trip, obviously, is about graphics in one sense or another. I mean, I've quoted before. Uh, here, this thing in the Argentinian magazine summer, finally coming to the conclusion that maybe what the whole thing was about was about the graphics, just as the Italian official, the official handbook for Italian radical architecture finally wonders if maybe making the models was not the whole thing was about. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think another, <coughs> yes, another spin-off maybe, I mean in the slightly more actually a, um, applied sense, if you take the, the, the freedom that, the, that was assumed that this sort of overall structural element would give to the smaller elements, one of the spin-offs may be uh, uh, slightly more um, niceness, i.e. accuracy, in, in handling fragmentation of units, even without any framework that is coming in. I mean, people aren't, if you take some of the, <coughs> if you take some of the work of those five architects, the exhibition mm -hmm. that was here, mm -hmm. uh, there is an embarrassment about the gap in between. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a sort of handling of, of fragmentation, both of units and of, and of operation of units in, uh, both in positioning and in time. Can I put it another way? Yes. Can I find yes. the answer to my own question? <laughs> um, yes. Something that like was, this. An answer to your question, which you can now put. Yeah, right. Uh, that in spite of the proposition in modern movement theory that the supporting frame and the walls are two different things, you know, they hardly ever happen in practice. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that makes a uh, habitat say, that is doubtful mega structure, is that the enclosing boxes in the structure are notionally one and the same thing. You know, there is no freedom in that sense. And if there's some generalized freedom in three-dimensional space, but not within the structure. One of the things I think uh, that mega structure did get people into finally was genuinely being able to support to separate the enclosure from the supporting frame. Yeah. You know, which is what the, the left spaces in all mega structures are about in some sense. Mm. And Denise got around to worry about how would anyone ever build a main structure in real life and have so much waste space inside it. The answer is the waste space becomes purely symbolic and is pushed up to one end uh, as incumbent order. Yeah. Um, but I think there was a, a real loosening up there uh, yeah. in the relationship between structure and usable body. Yeah. Implications. I mean, there's, there's, uh, well, there's extendability. Well, there's extendability, and there is a sort of implication that the structure, the uprights and the diagonals of the final in the structure, would be there, whether the flats were hung over them or not. I mean, the chances are the flats are in fact self supporting the structure, but I don't ask it over, I don't do the calculation side. Uh, but the implication of that, those, whatever it is, eight bays that are left open to form. Uh, the largest fascist portico of any British housing estate, um, is that there is some independence between the notional supporting frame, the giant head frames inside, and the uh, apartments on the outside. Whether in fact there is any real independence, I have very serious doubt. I'd be very surprised if one would, uh, even with the trip finance, uh, which produced uh, family estate, well, I don't think one would be allowed to do it so wasteful. But the implication is that, that the structure is one thing and the apartments are something else. Uh, maybe no more than an implication, but at least there is that visual signal, at least, that this is a mega structure. Would I push it any further than that? You know, but this, it seems to me what the scheme was trying to say. And actually, looking at the earlier versions of the scheme as published in the review, it seems to me that that concept of the separate structure comes through quite late the 1963 Outline Planning Commission, and first commercial developer, whatever they call proposals, don't seem to me to even have a set of structures. It's only to the commercial developer Mark II when scheme one is turned inside out, and you get a clear space down the middle, it's a structure down the middle, that the first signs of an, in, of a, an allegedly independent supporting structure begin to appear. I think it grew very slowly, that, that, that aspect of the design even though the terrace apartments were there right from the start. It's, it, it, sorry. it's very sad that given the sort of excitement <coughs> that was generated by the, the uh, idea of me megastructure that Cumbernaul has to sum it up, isn't it? Uh -huh. it, it taking your jazz yeah. analogy, it's as if jazz was summed up by Joe Loss instead of uh, no, as if jazz was 
summed up by Tommy Dawson. Or oh, <laughs> I, I <laughs> read the Joe Lawrence. Come on now. Um, well, do you feel I've taken too pessimistic view or exaggerated the case? Pessimistic? No, optimistic. You mean I think, you think I put too good a face on Calvin oh, yeah. or something? Oh, yeah. You do? Uh -huh. I guess being a literal minded East Anglian, you can only convince me of real things. You yeah, I've been you, desperately trying you, to. Think. You can flash ideas yeah. at me until you're blue in the yeah. face and I won't register, but show me something yeah. made of bricks and mortar. No, but it, it's sad. Uh, that's yeah. what I'm saying. I mean. Yeah, it is sad, I think. Yeah. You know? uh, and yet, it's so, it, it really streaks ahead of any of the other near misses in yeah. the other part of the world. Yeah. You know, and I don't find anything which gets anywhere near it in general, sort of opening up of the concept. Uh, boldness of vision and so I think all the other putative very nearly makes it well maybe the tang is Yamanishi. Mm. This is near as you get, you know. Because it has a certain amount of, you know, empty leg spaces and so on and looks as if it as if it might be extendable. Or there are sort of clues in the, those early Erskine uh, shopping things, I guess, aren't there? That, yeah. And you were talking yeah. There are certain clues there that Yeah. Uh, so that's whereas, I mean, to go back to the uh, Tom Shoemaker thing I suppose in last week, I think that we do expect a mega structure to make an external statement, you know, about itself and the city it finds itself in or whatever. Uh, I mean, I, don't, I think that monumentality stuff of PDF in fact is extremely relevant there. However, it's filtered down in the final forms in which we have it. The, the, I'm go, going on to Pelly by the way, yeah. but Pe Pelly did teach at UCLA, and there were in fact two ex-graduates worked on that Vienna. Who was that? Uh, I think Woody Scheffler was one of them, who was a Viennese. I remember Woody, yeah. Who was a Viennese. Yeah. Um, I mean, which, which is interesting, because they were well grounded uh -huh. that, that particular mm. year, um, which was a, a sort of 67, 68 lot, um, and very influenced by Warren. <laughs> to make a note of time. Right, any other useful information? I, um, I don't have any useful information. I but this, this is, is, this is, no, this is, this is, <laughs> Wooden Archie's McLuden's talking now. Um, I'm very confused because I'm, I, I really am wondering whether you're talking in terms of, uh, you know, whether you've got your tongue in your cheek or whether you're taking all this seriously, whether we deal really with a mythology uh, or, or some kind of fiction whatever is going to come out of this book that you're writing, Peter. Wow. Sorry, it's an attack. Uh, it's, it's visible fiction at one level. It's, uh, you know, the title megastructure, which seems to me sometimes to be in search of substance. Mm. I go along with that. Good. And I, I, I'm very, very confused at the moment because I, I, I can't understand how you can say that Cumbernauld is one of the... Um, kind of supreme examples of megastructures. Back to my first, the point I made in the first mm. lecture you gave about definition. Yeah. I still don't know. Uh, I won't say supreme example of, but what one has to say is most representative example of. Well, it's tell not me not necessarily that. a term of praise. Is it possible to a historian desperately looking for a definition or a representative example? Um, you know, I would say, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, whatever supreme example may mean, I don't think we have a supreme example of a built megastructure. The supreme examples are all, are, are all uh, graphic myths of one sort or another, I think. As if they're saying, in terms of what megastructure was apparently conceived to look like, what were its visible and tangible features, uh, Cumbernaul is the most complete. So is Thamesmead, or Milton Keynes? By that kind of thinking, I, uh, I had a, a offended, a offended, an offensive letter from Garrett Walker. Uh, well, I'm not saying, surprised. Yeah, saying that we're not allowed to say mega anything about them. So of course that, not. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm taking <laughs> to take your point. I mean, I haven't tried to grapple with Thames Mead uh, at all. 
uh, and this may be a serious deficiency. Uh, tends to be, frankly, if there's been much greater gloom than Cumberland or ever did, even in the worst weather. Um, but I think you're probably right that in terms of uh, organisation, conception, Thamesmead may be the biggest megastructure ever, insofar as it is uh, a continuous built structure. It seems to be a very low level exercise. I mean, it had many of the stylistic tricks, like the terrace right. and so forth, you know. Yeah. Uh, but there isn't really enough of it to see yet. I mean, from my point of view, we come to conclude it, it has to go in the book, but quite right. You know. Uh, but it will go in, but not quite over my dead body. But the dead tear stain. I don't see too much difference, you see. Uh, really? <laughs> because I think you can have a social megastructure as much as you can a physical one, which I think is what we've been talking about for the past. Right. Uh, having yeah, missed two, of course, yeah. of yeah. the lectures. But, um, you know, it's it been spread over six. And most of the examples are, it strikes me, physical examples. Okay. When in fact you've got a social megastructure as well. Well, I, I'm getting confused. You tell me what a social megastructure is. Well, I, I think that, you know, even this group of people around here are part of a, a kind of social megastructure. Or the area of Covent Garden, mm -hmm. or the area of Barnsbury or something, is a megastructure, I in my that. terms. If I, if, if I can find out what the definition of it is. You see, in your terms. Yeah. But I still don't know. No, okay. Um, I, I think we are. I mean, I think we are in a, in a difficulty here which goes far beyond the present discussion. Um, because uh, architects as a profession, planners as a profession, uh, have this perpetual problem about the physical container and the human culture. Well, it's still and stylistic or...? And, and which, one, which one are you talking about when you utter a phrase like Cotton Garden Community? Yeah, right. You know, I noticed you didn't use the word community. When did community go out? I mean, yeah. we're still current, that was last week. Still current about 5.30 this afternoon in my hearing. Um, I mean, is a social megastructure the same thing as what used to be a community? Are we defending the... Are we defending Very the good, yes. That's, that's my point, you see. That's where the, the uh, confrontation or something comes up. Quite frankly, I think it's you that's mucking about. <laughs> I'll think, leave. I think you're a couple of Scottish to on me. <laughs> let's, let's take your first definition again, because mm. I keep forgetting on purpose. Okay, well, uh, it's, a, it's a scholar's or librarian's definition, uh, and probably will appear a little dry uh, to warm-blooded architects, um, and those who care for the life of the community, etc. But what it says here is, Whereas the root meaning of the word carries the idea only of great size, in which case common government is a mega but we are, um, carries a meaning of great size, um, certain other characteristics have been frequently associated with the word from the time of its inception. A mega structure is thus not only a structure of great size, but is also a structure which is frequently colon. One, constructed of modular units. Oh, That's a God. bit dodgy, on, <laughs> but it's probably symbolic. To say the least. Uh, symbolically true of common law. Right. Uh, capable of great or even unlimited expansion. I think it might, 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 common law can in fact only go from one traffic intersection to the other. But that's a mile and a half. Uh, a structural framework into which smaller structural units, for example, rooms, houses, or small buildings of other sorts, can be built or even plugged in, quote unquote, or clipped on, quote unquote, after having been prefabricated elsewhere. I think only the gents' hairdresser uh, at uh, Cumberland Wise answers that part of the definition. For a structural framework, we expect to have a useful life much longer than that of the smaller structural units which it might support. Now, as far as the shops inside the concourse are concerned, that's true. Because they are, you know, they're just shop fitters work. I mean, I mean you know, window detailing work, and that's all. And there's really no solid substance in it, and they could easily be dismantled and moved, or whatever. And probably would be, maybe already had, but in financial street, I don't know. But that's the old basic. That's the old basic, basic, which is very much a, a physical definition. And it's on, a physical on that branch, the, so. the, I mean, I, I take one of Archer's points. On that ground, the, the timing of your book may be forcing a sort of slightly premature assumption in relation to common law of your first phrase this evening that the idea of megastructure is one of the few that came true in its own lifetime. I won't say that the aspirations of megastructure came true in their own. Well, you said, you said the idea yeah, of... Yeah, the idea was it, that was realised in physical terms. Uh, oh, but then, then you said there was motive. 
Well, I think that's true. Which I think is true. I think, uh, it, yeah. I think it's true. And certainly all the other stuff, all the homo rudens stuff, all the kind of stuff that's in your papers on mm. the on the fun pads and so on, still hasn't happened. Hasn't happened. No, no sign of it at all. No. You know, that it, even, in, even where the physical gizmology was built, the social education, etc., they were only delivered in a highly notional form. Yeah. But probably things like the um, um, theme pavilions at um, Montreal probably come as near as anything has in actual built fact mm. to delivering all the education, yeah. social, etc., etc. Uh, and certainly, as far as what's going on inside, I'm like prepared to admit I was stretching a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think the poison thumb was useful. We did find out a great deal about coming <laughs> I must say, which the ordinary visitor never discovers at all. It's a long way, isn't it? I'd like to hop back to the Tenzin thing here. Mm -hmm. The only real reason why Tenzin is depressed or even more than come on is that there are no wasteful baskets. Oh, no, there are other reasons besides that. Mm -hmm. well, that's all that's visible. There's certain wasteful baskets that come on. Yes, right. Yes. That definition, Peter, was yes. modular. Modular, extendable, modular, changeable. extendable, changeable, and with a gross structure which is expected to persist. Yeah, but that <laughs> describes Thamesmead <laughs> entirely. And Cumbernauld and Milwaukee. Well, it doesn't describe, no, it doesn't, <laughs> where else? It doesn't Everywhere. describe Cumbernauld, you see, because it isn't modular. Uh, well, it depends how you read that tartan grid and whether, in fact, any of the, is, you know. any of the major substructures are removable. What modules? <laughs> About I, I don't think so. I think it appears to be. I mean, you know, I think it appears to be. Yeah. It's important. And I, th I don't think there's any of those things which are not contained. Yeah, but deep you see, if you change the relation. <laughs> Sorry. Once you start pulling that apart and saying, well, it doesn't have to be modular, but it yeah. needs to be extendable, changeable, yeah. what was the other one? Uh, well, yeah, with a gross structure, it's gross structure. To persist. Yeah. Then yeah. I, I start then wondering, there must be lots of things that would meet that. Because he doesn't describe content at all. No, quite. Remember, I said earlier on that these are in the uh, Colin I mean, Row. He doesn't. Well, right. In the Colin Row of Francois Choi, separation of ideal cities and utopias, you see that megastructures were ideal cities. The social content is accidental almost. They, for the most part, created a physical frame in which it was hoped somebody else's utopia would happen. You know, the utopia of the. Uh, mobile leisure society or the do-it-yourself educa educated society or something. And it seems to me that most of them are only physical facilities. I, I mean, I know, I know when we were involved in this that, that we were much more interested in the multiplicity of... of and that's what of, got you out of, of the structures in the end. Ah. Isn't it? I mean, it's like that, that's the point of Peter Shirley. Yeah, yeah, but I, yeah. even at the time... I think that's true. I'm yeah. trying to write this stuff down at the yeah. moment, you know, trying to yeah. sort out what goes on, you know. And uh, I guess I guess I get the feeling uh, at some point, about half past five this afternoon, that the relationship between uh, archigram and megastructure may only be a graphic coincidence yes. in about yes. in, in the autumn of 1964 or thereabouts. Yes. You know. Yes. Well, on the other hand, you are clearly regarded by a lot of people as being in some ways the animators of history, some kind of megastructure international. No, it certainly seems dubious and marginal to me in that sort of sense. Now, I would, I would stick to the point I made quite early on, that, that if you're talking utopias, then I don't think megastructures are. They are ideal constructions which form, as it were, the physical support in which a utopia with luck can happen. But the utopian social content is not built into the design. It's no more than a, a generalized aspiration that comes with it, if there. I think in the process it shows up a whole lot of other architectural utopias too. Mm -hmm. It makes certain sure. deficiencies of architectural utopianism very clear. Mm -hmm. is, there, is that why you more or less excluded Solari in your discussions? Mm -hmm. Because he was kind of utopian. Uh, he wasn't you know, a consensus architect. Well, as I, as I said, I mean, every statement made in these uh, these six weeks contains the implied sub clause except Paolo Soleri or making allowance for Paolo Soleri or for some C or um, It may be that he is more utopian. I mean, certainly his intentions are 
utopian, I find it hard to read in what actually gets built. But certainly the intentions are utopian, the rhetoric is utopian, etc. Um, the manner of construction, in a sense, is utopian, and it contains a strong do it yourself community participation element, and so on, whereas the others are quite clearly all built by professionals. You know. Uh, even the Fun Palace, I realise, Mr. Price, mm -hmm. um, the actual moving of the petitions and so on would be done by professional stage crews. Correct. Right? Yeah. Correct. You know, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. People, people don't arrange their own games balls, professionals do it for them. That's right. They yeah. only, they only right. show their ball by not turning up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, so there again, I think Soleri is, is out of line with the rest of it, though for all sorts of reasons, obviously, you could never leave him out. You know. I mean, even on that uh, definition there, yes, the project of very great size, conceivably they're constructed in modular units, if you look as much as company as any now. Uh, you know, structural framework, you know, with smaller structural units could be fitted, I mean, it could be true of a uh, solarity project. The structural frameworks would have a useful life much longer than the smaller structural units. Well, quite obviously, those investments for something the size of Laser City has got to have a useful life, of, you know, 250,000 years, and before you can see any, any real social or economic return on it. Um, but I would be loath at any level to force Solari into this body of definition. He will always be there somewhere around the argument, but he the standard classifications. You know, he can never be left out, but he can never be dragged in either.